Good morning. I'm Valerie Castro in for Savannah Sellers. Good to have you with us on this Friday. I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, winter wipeout. A historic holiday storm is bringing wind, snow, and record low temperatures to nearly half the country this morning. And the storm is already causing chaos on the roads, along with massive delays at airports along the East Coast. We have the very latest on the path of the storm and how it will impact your holiday plans. The full story. Overnight, the January 6th committee released its full report into the attack on the Capitol. This morning, we're going to dive into the role the committee says former President Trump played in the riot and the alleged pressure campaign to overturn the 2020 election, plus what the report's conclusion could mean for Trump's political future. The holiday dash, still scrambling to get a gift for everyone on your list this year? Well, you're not alone and you've come to the right place. We're going to break down some of the best last minute gift ideas you can still get this year just in time for the holidays. And can't miss list if it is Friday. That means we are taking a look at some of the best ideas and entertainment for the weekend. From the top movies to the best TV shows to watch at home, we've got you covered right as the holiday weekend gets underway. And no doubt you might be hunkering down at home with your family, with your friends this holiday weekend, because it is going to be chilly all across the country, no matter where you live. And we're going to begin this hour with what is being called a once-in-a-generation winter storm. It is sweeping the country this holiday weekend. Right now, more than 200 million people are under weather alerts from coast to coast as heavy snow, wind, and extreme cold threatens holiday plans for millions of travelers two days before Christmas. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa has the latest from Chicago. Chicago's O'Hare Airport. Hey, good morning. The storm has hit and the impact is staggering. This is by far the craziest morning that we've seen at O'Hare so far this week and the numbers really lay it out. We've been watching flight aware this morning and nationwide so far this morning we've seen more than 800 delays and more than 3000 flights canceled. Obviously those numbers are normally inverted. We usually have more delays than cancellations, but it speaks to how conservative the airlines and the airports are being with this weather in mind. It's also a mess on the roads, crashes are piling up and all of this of course with just 2 days until Christmas. This morning, a massive winter storm and a dangerous deep freeze wreaking widespread havoc on holiday travel. Nationwide, more than 10,400 flights delayed Thursday, 2,600 canceled, derailing plans for tens of thousands to spend Christmas with loved ones. I'm going to have to stick it out here and see if I can make it to Indiana. Snow, high winds, and a brutal Arctic chill sweeping across the Great Plains and Midwest into the Northeast. More than a quarter of flights canceled in Denver, nearly 540 at Chicago O'Hare, a major hub for United and American Airlines. It was really chaos. It was back and forth. And when, one minute, there's a flight at 8.30 or 6.45, and then a minute, it's gone. The ripple effects leaving no region untouched, even Tampa feeling the air travel pain. We were checking every few hours to make sure that we weren't going to be delayed or canceled. Tens of millions on the roads struggling too. Whiteout conditions in places like Kansas and Missouri making driving dangerous and leaving some motorists stranded. State to state, hundreds of crashes reported on the roads due to severe weather conditions. Powerful winds and Arctic air causing flash freezes. That's when temperatures plummet very quickly. In Cheyenne, Wyoming, temps dropping below zero with wind chills as cold as minus 50. In New York, the winds making a dangerous situation worse Thursday when a small fire broke out on the Staten Island Ferry. 700 passengers forced to wait in freezing winds to be rescued. Governors, meanwhile, in at least half a dozen states declaring states of emergency, pleading with people to play it safe and hunker down for the holidays. This is not going to be a typical storm. In fact, this could be a life threatening storm. Please take it seriously. All right, so those warnings in mind, some advice from the experts this morning, both experts and officials, frankly, say if you're looking to drive, if you can, they actually ask that you stay home. But they say if you must drive, allow plenty of time, obviously take it slow and watch the forecast as you go. If you're looking to fly and your flight is canceled in particular, experts say do not show up at the airport. They say your best bet is actually to try and rebook it online or through your airline's app. And they say if and when you do rebook, definitely try to do it in the morning because as we've seen, delays and cancellations stack up throughout the day. Back to you. 
So much to keep in mind if you're traveling this weekend. Maggie, thanks so much. Let's keep the team coverage going as we monitor the conditions for you across the country. Take a look at that split screen. NBC News correspondent Shaq Brewster's in the Midwest, where a blizzard warning is now in effect. NBC News correspondent Marissa Parra has the latest on the bomb cyclone that's heading to the East Coast. Shaq, we are going to start with you and your ski goggles as this blizzard is sweeping through Michigan, <laughs> where you are right now. I'm just going to let you take it away. What are you seeing? Well, I'll tell you, we are really feeling the impact of this massive storm here in Benton Harbor, Michigan. Just so you get a sense of where it is, it is right across the lake from Chicago. And you mentioned that blizzard warning that is in effect. Well, this is what it looks like. Believe it or not, this is an area that hasn't seen a blizzard warning in some six years, nearly six years since its last blizzard warning. So you have the snow. They're going to be getting a lot of snow here, up to two feet of snow in some places. You go to different areas, uh, they're going to see more than that. And the snow combined with the wind, I'm sure you see it in the picture. That is why you have officials, Michigan State Police, saying it's too late to start any Christmas uh, travel right now. Stay off the roads because what happens is you have the snow you have the wind whipping around the snow that is already on the ground. That creates for those whiteout conditions, very low visibility on the roads at this point. And then, guys, I can't let you go without talking about this, uh, the temperature here. I have to shake <laughs> off the thermometer, but the thermometer says about four degrees, maybe two degrees there. I'll tell you, you factor in the wind chill, it feels like 22 degrees below zero truly truly frigid conditions that folks here in the midwest are dealing with Shaq, you're a trooper and with all that wind and snow power outages are a real possibility but with this arctic blast we're experiencing yeah. like you said freezing temperatures could be life-threatening what should people do if they lose power in the storm yeah you know officials say it really starts now if you have power if you are watching us right now make sure your batteries are fully charged make sure your phone is fully charged check those batteries for things like flashlights for radios uh, one other tip is turn down the temperature on your refrigerator right now make it as cold as possible that way if you lose power you can still preserve those items if you do lose power you want to dress in layers dress in those layers close the room the doors to the rooms that you don't use put a towel underneath you want to keep that heat in as much as possible Possible, keep it insulated because yes we talk about the wind and snow but the temperatures is what makes the storm so dangerous especially if you're not protected and especially if you lose power last power report that we saw there are a few thousand people th who have lost power throughout the state so that is a lower number but remember they're expecting the highest wind gusts to come later today here we're expecting about 60 mile an hour wind gusts so that is when you have the most danger of those tree limbs falling and more power outages uh, so stay ready by getting ready, and that will help you keep you safe. Shaq, we are going to let you go and try and warm up for a little bit. Marissa, oh, that, you. that is your crystal <laughs> ball right there. You're looking at Shaq right now and thinking, okay, is that what's coming to me? Whiteout conditions, big temp drops. Uh, what is it you're seeing and what is it you're bracing for right now? Well, we're bracing for a lot of what we just saw in Shaq's live shot. I, for those of you who are watching from the Northeast, like where we are right now, we've made our way on the roads from D.C. through Maryland, through Delaware, now to here in Pennsylvania. And it's just been rain, rain, and more rain. It's been a pretty gloomy holiday travel uh, season so far, at least the last 24 hours. But we know that that is soon about to change. Yeah, those images of snow plows are coming our way. We know that we're going to be seeing that soon. Those Arctic temperatures expected to hit here in the Northeast actually sometime within the next hour or so expected to last throughout the afternoon. So for those of you who have been watching, for those of you who have been trying to make your holiday plans, just keep this in mind. What we're seeing right now, which is precipitation, the rain that just moved in the last 15 minutes could soon into could soon turn into freezing temperatures. And Marissa, we know the airports are already a mess today. If people are going to drive for the holiday weekend, is it too late to head out at this point? Well, safety officials, of course, are going to wish that you've already done that. Uh, they're, of course, going to say that, yeah, it, 
maybe the time has passed if you're trying to fly or drive once these Arctic temperatures move in and, and conditions get pretty unsafe on the roads. But I will say that so far from what we've seen, there have been a lot of people taking to the roads. We know the majority of Americans who do holiday traveling, 90 percent, 102 million Americans are projected to be taking to the roads during the holiday season. And we saw a lot of them. You're looking at video of what we saw on the roads. So take a listen to some of the people that we caught up with as they were trying to get their last minute travel plans in before the weather moved in. How does it compare to years prior? It's a little worse, you know, it's crowded out here. I'm so happy to be on the road though instead of on a plane. Yeah, we've been driving since five o'clock in the morning. Driving 55 miles in a road and 70 miles road, so it's been crazy. Mm -hmm. A lot of rain, uh, a lot of people in the road, so we gotta be careful there. So my message to the Northeast is you've had it good so far. Yes, it's been gloomy, but it's really just been rainy, but it's coming. What we saw in Shack Shot is coming. So please be careful on the roads if that is how you choose to travel, especially as you take those bridges. They are going to be icy, so just take it slow. All right, Back Marissa, you thank you so much. And let's get a check now on the forecast this morning. Meteorologist Angie Lastman joins us now with the latest. Good morning, Angie. Good morning, guys. In a busy day, you've seen the scenes from uh, both those locations where it is just a mess. Uh, Philadelphia not seeing a whole lot going on right now, as you know, but there's still some moisture that's going to work in, and we're still expecting some slick roads there, and we will be watching for the rain to eventually turn into some frozen uh, ice along the roadways there. As we look at your satellite and radar picture, you can see plenty of snow drain across Michigan. Folks there are dealing with that stretching into Pittsburgh. That's what we're going to see uh, eventually transition into parts of western New York in interior areas of New England where we'll really watch for that lake effect snow to get going and produce really high amounts of, of snow. Look at what we're expecting in places like Buffalo. Forecast for two to two and a half feet, uh, even up to three feet is possible. It's not really so much the amount of snow that we're really focusing on here. It's that combined with the wind because we have winds that could be anywhere from 50 to 70 miles per hour for prolonged periods. Buffalo could see those blizzard whiteout conditions for 30 or so hours. That's going to make saving or, or rescuing anyone that's in maybe stranded in a car on the roadways really difficult. We're not going to see a whole lot of clearing going on with the situation continuing to unfold through Saturday. So just be aware of that if you're in that location. The Along the coast, really east of that, not a whole lot of snow experience. Expected, but still going to be a windstorm for much of the Northeast, Mid Atlantic, and into parts of the Midwest and in, into the Great Lakes. 53 mile per hour winds expected in Detroit, 53 mile per hour winds expected in Pittsburgh, and there's that 70 plus mile per hour that I mentioned for Buffalo, New York City, 46 miles per hour. So this is widespread strong winds that will likely cause more power outages. We're already seeing over 500,000 people out of power across the country. That number expected to climb for sure as the windstorm really gets going and take shape in some of these highly populated areas. I mentioned the wet surfaces from the rain. We're going to have a quick temperature drop. The bottom really falls out and in a hurry here as we go through uh, the next 12 hours or so. You can see how these temperatures change in places like D.C., 44 degrees now, New York, 50 degrees now. But then by the time 7 o'clock rolls around, uh, we're talking 30-plus temperature degree dro drop with D.C. coming in at 10 degrees. That means that the roads will be untreated. We're, not gonna, we're still going to see some water on the roadways from the rain that we're seeing, uh, and that means that black ice will be really possible, especially as you're getting out to travel. Dangerous cold, it's wide, wide reaching, widespread across the area, 24 degrees below in Kansas City. And folks, even in Orlando, going to see those feels like temperatures in the 20s. Something for everyone this holiday weekend. All right, Angie, thank you so much. Now to the January 6th investigation. Days after releasing a summary of its findings, the bipartisan committee capped off its historic investigation, releasing its final report overnight. Now, former President Trump has yet to comment, but earlier this week called the committee's work a partisan attempt to sideline him in his 2024 presidential bid. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles joins us now. Ryan, good morning. Hey, Joe, good morning to you. Yeah, this report, the result of 18 months of work by the select committee, and their overall conclusion is that the former president, Donald Trump, is the one largely responsible for the events of January 6th. Overnight, the January 6th select committee releasing its final report. 
a more than 800-page narrative that concludes former President Donald Trump is directly responsible for the violence on that day. It was just something that I think for most Americans, it was beyond imagination. The report providing evidence Trump and members of his inner circle in an effort to cling to power and overturn his 2020 election defeat, quote, engaged in at least 200 apparent acts of public or private outreach, pressure or condemnation in the two months between the election and the attack on the nation's capital. It had not been for the encouragement of Donald Trump. Would have never occurred. It would have been the normal transfer of power uh, that we do every four years when there's a presidential election. The report comes just days after the nine-member committee voted to recommend the Department of Justice pursue criminal charges against Mr. Trump, including obstruction of an official proceeding, Congress's certification of electoral votes, and inciting or assisting others in an insurrection. Earlier this week, the former president called the committee's work, quote, a partisan attempt to sideline him in his 2024 presidential bid. The committee also beginning to release hundreds of pages of transcripts, including an interview with star witness, former White House aide Cassidy Hutchinson, who claimed Stefan Passantino, a lawyer with ties to the former president, suggested she withhold information from the committee, saying, quote, the less the committee thinks you know, the better. In a statement, Passantino said he represented Hutchinson, quote, honorably, ethically, and fully consistent with her sole interests as she communicated them to me. The January 6th report also includes 11 recommendations to ensure nothing like the attack on the Capitol ever happens again. Among them, urging Congress to consider passing legislation to bolster its subpoena power, increase penalties against those who threaten election workers, and strengthen the nation's laws against insurrection. That would, in effect, bar President Trump from holding office again. No man who would behave that way at that moment in time can ever serve in any position of authority in our nation again. He is unfit for any office. And it is important to point out that the committee's criminal referrals to the Department of Justice carry no legal weight. The decision to indict the former president or any of his top aides is now in the hands of special counsel Jack Smith, who's in charge of the DOJ investigation. And committee chairman Benny Thompson said that Smith will have access to all the evidence that the committee has collected. Joe. All right, Ryan Nobles, thank you so much. Christmas is only two days away, and even if you're a last-minute shopper, time is running out to bag a late holiday bargain. But don't panic just yet. NBC News correspondent Emily Aketa is here to help you check those final things off of your list. Emily, good morning. Good morning to both of you. You know, it really happens to the best of us. You don't mean to wait until the last minute, and then all of a sudden, it's the eve of Christmas Eve, and there are still items to be checked off your list. Well, we are here to help you navigate the final countdown to Christmas. It's the final stretch of the dash for deals. And this morning, holiday procrastinators are scrambling to scoop up last minute gifts in what's expected to be one of the busiest shopping days of the year. If you can concentrate on those things that retailers want to offload, you actually have the potential to save really big. Retailers are slashing prices on holiday gift sets, toys and games, and smaller consumer electronics with mounting pressure to clear out shelves amid an uncertain economy. This MacBook Air is going for 20% off at Best Buy. You'll find up to 50% off kitchen appliances at Target. And Kohl's is luring in customers with up to 30% off Lego building sets. Deep discounts winning over perennial procrastinators like Meredith McFadden. That last minute <laughs> energy, that's the way I get things done, like under pressure all the time. The National Retail Federation reports just over half of U.S. consumers finish their shopping in the week leading up to Christmas. If you're feeling that pressure ahead of the holiday weekend, digital gifts make for easy last-minute presents, like subscriptions for books, video games, and streaming services, which are considered the top tech gift this season. And then, of course, there's e-gift cards. Remember to give them a personal flair. If you can wrap it up in a fun way, um, that can really help make it seem just a little more personalized. You can also package a gift card with accessories that go along with it. And for those gifts Santa isn't delivering, there are still shipping options. Today is the final day to utilize USPS and FedEx in time for Christmas, but expect to turn over hefty fees along with your package. At this point, it's like I'm going to pay the extra money for the extra shipping. The other day, I paid $35 for something to be shipped in time.
Retailers like Walmart and Amazon offer even more flexibility through part of Christmas Eve with same-day shipping. For Amazon, that process plays out at its same-day sites, which will push out roughly 600,000 packages today alone. You can place your order on Christmas Eve and still get it under the tree in time and still get it within hours under the tree on time. A last-minute scramble for sales and the final countdown to Christmas. Okay, Emily, is this wind, sweeping winter storm going to be a problem for all of these last minute orders? Very good question on everyone's mind. So overall, according to industry analyst Shit Matrix, widespread delays have been quite minimal. So really good news there. You can find updates on the carrier's websites and in some cases have your package rerouted to a new address if need be. If you are still shopping, experts say lean on curbside and in-store pickup to avoid the rush of procrastinators. Just be mindful of those cutoff times. But how about you guys? Are you still checking things off your list today? I think I'm done now. I, I think I'm more. good. One oh, more? I'm That's not bad. How about you? It's better than me. I, you know, I've been covering holiday shopping and deals since October and yet yeah. Still, I have things to it's do. because we've so. been keeping you busy yeah, covering holiday shopping and yeah. deals. You haven't been able to take your advice and apply it to yourself. Yeah, so. I might have to go with we'll, gift card route. We'll set you free to do that right now, all Thanks, right? Thanks, guys. Emily Akeda, thank you so much. Appreciate that. Coming up, further fallout from Ukrainian President Zelensky's trip to the U.S. Yeah, we want, we're going to find out how Russia is reacting to the visit, along with what might come next for the war in Ukraine. That's when we come back. Stay with us. You are watching Morning News Now. We're back with the latest on spiking flu and COVID cases across the country, filling hospitals to capacity and causing nationwide medicine supply shortages. NBC News national correspondent Gabe Gutierrez has the latest on the triple threat plaguing the hospitals this holiday season. I just put an IV in them. At Hackensack Meridian's Jersey Shore University Medical Center, they're bracing for a long winter. Have you ever seen numbers like this before? Unprecedented would be the word I would use. Unprecedented volumes. David Clark works in the ER. He and his colleagues are seeing firsthand the impact of the so-called triple-demic, RSV, flu, and COVID. It is something that we have not seen in the past. I have been in and around emergency departments for well over 30 years and have not seen anything along these lines before. The big unknown for us at this point is what kind of a COVID season are we going to have? Obviously, we had two very difficult winters the past two years, and I think we have to brace for that. While RSV cases seem to have peaked across much of the country, flu and COVID cases are up. Six-year-old Juan Carlo Aguiar in San Diego came down with the flu and spent 10 days in the hospital. It's the worst feeling that a mother can go through, seeing your child just intubated in a bed. Health officials in Chicago are preparing to hit what they call a high-risk level for COVID by next week and may soon recommend an indoor masking advisory. Public schools in Passaic, New Jersey, are already reinstating a mask mandate for students and staff. There's a lot of people that are wishy-washy with the vaccination, so I feel like that's probably the safest bet. 65 year old Dory Greenberg was hospitalized with COVID twice. When you can't breathe, it's the most scariest thing in the world. She credits the vaccine and booster shot with saving her life. I really feel that I was, would have been much, much, much worse without it. Also, the CDC just issuing a new health advisory warning of an increase of a rare bacterial infection, invasive strep A, among children. Back to you. Gabe, thanks so much. Turning to the war in Ukraine, there is more reaction to President Zelensky's visit to the United States, this time from Russia. Speaking yesterday, President Putin downplayed the Patriot defense system that Washington is planning to supply to Ukraine. He says Russia wants to end the war soon. NBC News foreign correspondent Matt Bradley joins us now from Kiev with the latest. Matt, good morning. So first of all, walk us through some of these comments from Putin. I mean, what does he make of this latest U.S. military aid package? And how serious is he about ending this war? Yeah, Joe, I mean, this just vindicates, the whole visit just vindicates something that the Kremlin has been saying from the beginning of this war, which is that they're not really fighting against Ukraine, they're fighting against the whole West, all of NATO, and specifically the United States. So this is something that plays right into Russian propaganda, uh, and, you know, something that they've been saying. So it's not necessarily going to be anything new for the Kremlin, and especially something that they're going to be trotting out and have been trotting out to the public for quite a long time. Now, those comments about the Patriot missile system, that was the signature element of this aid package that went 
to the Ukrainians during Zelensky's visit. He said that the S-300 system that the Russians have is a better system. And he said that even if the U.S. uses its Patriot missiles, there will always be an antidote. Now, they also said that, um, you know, this was oh, these comments that, as you mentioned, that uh, Vladimir Putin is going to be negotiating with Russia or with Ukraine and that all wars end with the negotiation. Now, this was laughed off in Washington. And John Kirby, who's the national security spokesman uh, for the White House, he basically said that Putin has shown zero interest so far in any negotiations. And it's pretty clear that the Ukrainians are not going to be negotiating with an, uh, an enemy who they consider to be treacherous from long before this latest invasion. Joe? So, Matt, we've also seen the U.S. accuse North Korea of supplying weapons to a private Russian military group. What's going on here? What are all the sides saying about it? Well, that's been denied by both the Wagner Group and by the North Koreans. It was agreed by the U.K. The U.K. came out and said that their intelligence backs that up as well. But this isn't new in terms of North Korea's involvement. Russia has been going to North Korea in the past, trying to get new weapons. It just goes to show the desperation in Moscow for weapons and how effective these sanctions have been, that they would go to a country like North Korea, which has such an inferior military, to try to get additional armaments. But the fact is, the real news here is that they would be giving them not necessarily to the Russian government, but directly to the Wagner Group. And the Wagner Group is, you know, that's not the government. That's a private military firm run by uh, Pierzugin, I'm going to butcher that name, uh, who's a very close ally of Putin. And that private military outfit has tens of thousands of soldiers. They're the ones who have been doing a lot of the fighting on the front lines, particularly in Bakhmut, where Zelensky was earlier this week. Joe. And Matt, very quickly here, Christmas two days away. What is the mood like right now in Ukraine? We're just seeing a lot of people who really want to have a really nice Christmas here. And it's something that we're going to be seeing for the next couple of days. It's heartwarming to go around Kiev and see all of the decorations up and seeing kids enjoying themselves. Um, you know, it really is going to be, as Zelensky said, a Christmas that's cloaked in darkness because of the electrical power outages, because of the continued bombardment. It's sad, but it's bittersweet. Joe? Incredible that we're seeing those lights and decorations when you consider where things were at the beginning of this year. Matt, thank you so much for your reporting. Appreciate it. More international headlines now. A historic snowstorm is causing a mess for people in Japan. Raf Sanchez joins us from London with that and other world news. Raf, good morning. Joe, Valerie, good morning. That's right, Japan has been just hammered by historic levels of snow over the last week. It's killed at least eight people and injured dozens more. The snow's falling mainly along the coast of the Sea of Japan in the north and west of the country. Trains are suspended and authorities are asking people to refrain from non-essential trips outside the house until at least Monday. In Pakistan, a powerful car bomb went off this morning, killing one police officer and two suspected militants. At least 10 other people wounded, and the Pakistani Taliban have claimed responsibility. This happened in the city of Islamabad, which is widely considered to be one of the safest cities in Pakistan, and that's raising fears about militant presence there. And finally, both, Sco both Spain and Scotland are making it easier for people to legally change their gender without approval from doctors. Up until now in Spain, you needed a formal diagnosis of gender dysmorphia, but under this new law, anyone over 16 can now simply change their legal registration. Younger teenagers will still need approval from their parents or a judge. So guys, it's interesting to see the law changing to keep up with changing social norms. And also keeping up with what many of the experts say as well. All right, Raph, thank you so much. Coming up, a jury is now deciding the fate of rapper Tory Lanez. He's the man accused of shooting artist Megan The Stallion. The potential outcomes of the trial and the key details Megan gave the jury. Next. We're back with the latest on the water crisis in Jackson, Mississippi. For months, we've been reporting the complaints by residents about long-standing water issues. Now the EPA is stepping in. NBC News correspondent Zinkley Esamwa brings us an update. 35-year-old Danica Samuel is a mom of six and lifelong resident of Jackson, Mississippi, a city plagued with a decades-long water crisis. Water in the city is deemed safe to drink, but many residents still don't trust it. You just see my mama do the same thing that I do now for my kids. Every morning we come downstairs, we get us a big tall bottle of water. They put it on their towel, they wash their face, and they brush their teeth. 
The water crisis triggering an NAACP complaint in September alleging racist policies by Governor Tate Reeves and the state of Mississippi, claiming federal money was allocated to smaller majority white communities instead of Jackson. Governor Reeves previously said his administration is committed to ensuring all federal funds are made available on an objective and race neutral basis. The Environmental Protection Agency now investigating if Mississippi violated the Civil Rights Act. No city uh, in the United States of America uh, should have a fragile system that leaves 190,000 citizens without clean water to drink. EPA Administrator Michael Reagan says the federal government has not adequately invested in communities. Why do you think that a city that's over 80 percent black is facing a decades-long water crisis? Environmental justice is a serious issue in this country, which is why the president has made it a priority. We know black brown, tribal communities, low-income communities have seen a lack of investment, but also are on the front lines of the impacts of these lack of investments and climate change. Jackson was the first city Reagan visited following his 2021 appointment. I saw porta potties lined all along the school, and I thought that was due to construction. But that's what the students have been using for years because they've been dealing with low water pressure. The White House says new bipartisan legislation will invest at least $50 billion in the nation's infrastructure, including expanding access to clean drinking water. It's my hope that the people of Jackson now get the type of relief that they've been looking for for decades. Danica Samuel hopes that relief comes soon. I want my six kids to have a wonderful future. I want this to go somewhere so my kids won't have to worry about unclean water. Zinclair Samoa, NBC News, Jackson. Jury deliberations are set to continue this morning in the high-profile trial of rapper Tory Lanez. He is accused of shooting mega music superstar Megan Thee Stallion in the foot back in 2020. NBC News correspondent Nayela Charles has the latest. Two stars head-to-head -head in a shooting trial now waiting on a verdict. The case is in jurors' hands. They will decide if musician Tory Lanez is guilty of shooting rapper Megan Thee Stallion, real name Megan Pete. The Canadian hip-hop star who pleaded not guilty, known for his hit single Say It, is charged with the 2020 shooting of the Grammy-winning rapper, known for her sensual rhymes. On the stand, Megan said Tory Lane shot her after telling her to, quote, dance, following an argument inside an SUV. They had just left a party at Kylie Jenner's home. Megan facing intense scrutiny on social media and from hip-hop bloggers questioning her account. She testified, I don't want to live. I wish he had just shot and killed me if I had to go through this torture. Have you seen a lot of misinformation about this case being spread on social media? Absolutely. Uh, particularly, again, with bloggers who don't have legal backgrounds, they want to receive engagement. Uh, they want people to talk. They want people to speculate. And you can only hope that the jury is insulated enough. But the practical reality is lawyers know that somehow, some way, information finds its way into the jury room, even if you can't prove it later. The district attorney referencing the commentary during the trial Wednesday saying, why would she lie? She's been subjected to a stream of hate. For what? For coming forward as a victim of domestic violence? The trial full of surprises. One unexpected turn when Megan's former best friend, Kelsey Harris, testified, recanting her interview with investigators about the incident in which she identified Tory Lanez as the shooter, saying parts of the interview weren't accurate, according to the Associated Press. Then Megan's lawyer stated that her former bodyguard, another witness, was missing after he didn't come to court for his testimony. Instead, he was at the World Cup in Qatar, seen here on his Instagram. The L.A. district attorney declined to comment on their witness that failed to appear. Now Lane's facing up to 22 years behind bars if convicted on counts of assault with a semi-automatic handgun, carrying a loaded unregistered firearm in a vehicle, and discharging a firearm with gross negligence. He declined to testify, the defense calling Megan the Stallion a liar. Ultimately, defense's goal was to confuse to hypersexualize Megan, and ultimately it was a strategy that was all over the place. Our thanks to Nayela Charles for that report. Coming up, TikTok banned on campus. More universities are pulling the plug over security concerns. So what this means for students using the app next. You're watching Morning News Now.
Welcome back from soaring inflation and rising interest rates to a fond farewell to the famous Choco Taco. This year has been a difficult one for the consumer. NBC News business and data reporter Brian Chung looks back on a whirlwind 2022 for the economy. Overall inflation picked up steam over the beginning of 2022, clocking in at 9% in June, the fastest pace of price increases since the 1980s. Food prices soared, a gallon of milk now averaging $4.22. Chicken, a buck 84 a pound, and a dozen grade A eggs, $3.59 a dozen, all more expensive than this time last year. Gas prices top $5 a gallon in the summer before tilting below $3.50 in the later part of the year. And then rent, the biggest spend for most households, jumping 7 to 8%. Inflation did show signs of backing off in the later parts of the year as the Federal Reserve accelerated the pace of its interest rate increases. One quarter percentage point, a half percentage point, three quarters of a percentage point. The Fed continued to raise rates at that pace, a speed not seen in decades. The idea to make borrowing costs expensive enough to slow the economy and inflation. Among the sharpest slowdowns in the housing market, where home buyers are saying nope to sky high mortgage rates, 30 year fixed rates topped out at 7% in the fall, more than double what it was a year ago. The tech sector faced a pullback as well as Amazon and Meta laid off thousands of workers. I want to say, you know, up front uh, that I take full responsibility for this decision. The tech layoffs did not appear to have a major impact on a strong jobs market where the unemployment rate touched a 50 year low of 3.5 percent in September. Instead, the damage was done in the stock market where the S&P 500 lost about a quarter of its value. Tech stocks were among the biggest losers. Is everyone with me? Yeah. All right, then let's do that. Meanwhile, labor unions at warehouses and coffee shops across the country mounted challenges against America's largest companies demanding better pay, benefits, and working conditions. Among other business headlines, a cascade of bankruptcies in the crypto space, a flurry of high-profile mega-mergers, and the discontinuation of the beloved Choco Taco. And a major theme for the American consumer, revenge spending. All the catch-up on experiences and things impossible to do in 2020. A falling euro fueled American vacations abroad, and 2.56 million Americans hit the airport the Sunday after Thanksgiving this year, the highest number since 2019. And if there was any doubt about whether or not the in-theater experience was alive, <laughs> Top Gun Maverick broke a record for box office ticket sales in any Memorial Day weekend ever. A blast from the past, a fitting theme for a 2022 in which people longed for a return to normal. No kidding. All right, Brian, thank you so much. Coming up, the winter weather across the country has a lot of people staying inside this weekend. So whether you're avoiding the cold or whether you're hanging out with family for the holidays, not avoiding your family, we have the list of the shows and movies you cannot miss. That's coming up next. We're back with financial headlines. Facebook's parent company Meta is settling a major lawsuit over privacy concerns. CNBC's Pippa Stevens joins us now with that and other news. Good morning, Pippa. Good morning. Well, Meta has agreed to pay $725 million to settle a class action lawsuit accusing Facebook of allowing Cambridge Analytica to access users' personal information. The suit stems from revelations in 2018 that Facebook let the political consulting firm gain access to data from as many as 87 million users. Lawyers for the plaintiffs called the proposed settlement the largest ever in a U.S. data privacy case. And several universities in Alabama, Georgia, and Oklahoma are moving to ban TikTok on school computers and Wi-Fi networks. Over concerns, the app reports user data to the Chinese government. TikTok is owned by ByteDance, which is based in Beijing. Gizmodo reports TikTok has been blocked by the University of Oklahoma and Auburn, but students can still access the app on their personal devices. TikTok says the bans are based on, quote, unfounded falsehoods. And Apple is offering last-minute shoppers a free two-hour delivery from its retail stores. While you can no longer buy an iPhone 14 Pro online, certain models can still be purchased at Apple stores, and they'll be delivered through Christmas Eve. Apple's regular two-hour delivery costs $9, but that's been waived for the holidays, and I'm just happy to know I'm not the only last-minute shopper. Yeah, no kidding. That would be a nice last-minute gift, too, if someone's getting you an <laughs> iPhone or something. So, all right, Pippa Stevens, thank you so much.
Many are calling it a mind-blowing advance in artificial intelligence, a new program that can write term papers, software, and even legal documents all in a matter of seconds. But as Jake Ward explains, it's also raising some alarming questions. Amar Reshi asked a computer program to write a book. I think it was write a children's book about a young girl who creates her own AI. And in a weekend, Alice and Sparkle was finished. Well, Sparkle was a magical AI that Alice created. Wow. Chat GPT is technology accessible and free to anyone on the web that impersonates what it's read on the internet. Type in a request and it can write legal documents, software, even school essays. People are predicting it will wipe out whole industries. Attorneys, realtors, are we going to be out of a job? But chat GPT as an AI system may pose ethical risks to users who are unaware of how the technology works. It in no way is reflecting the depths of human understanding or human intelligence. What it's really good at doing is mimicking its form. In fact, remember what I said earlier? But chat GPT as... Well, I asked chat GPT to write that line for me. Users who are... Then I asked for a knock-knock joke. Knock-knock, who's there? Chat GPT. Chat GPT who? Chat GPT, careful, you might not know how it works. What parts of our society could this change? The valuing of work, of human creativity. There are concerns around deception and potential uses for fraud. But I think that that's sort of only the tip of the iceberg here. The company that makes ChatGPT, OpenAI, was co-founded by Elon Musk and is now primarily backed by Microsoft. The company declined our request for an interview. The kids Amar made the book for seemed to like it. But writers and illustrators on social media did not. There are some super valid concerns from these artists. After all, ChatGPT could wipe out his job, too. Literally my line of work, you know, uh, apps, uh, design work, um, you know, product design work. And now he wants someone to solve this problem. What are mechanisms we can still compensate artists? That's the lesson to you here. That, that's definitely the lesson. Jake Ward, NBC News, San Francisco. Time for the good talker. The trailer has dropped for the eagerly awaited follow-up to that 70s show. It's called That 90s Show. In the trailer, Netflix showed us the return of the original characters and their kids. The familiar faces include Topher Grace, Wilmer Valderrama, Mila Kunis, and Ashton Kutcher. The reboot drops on Netflix on January 19th. And for those who want to rewatch that 70s show, well, you can do so on Peacock, which is, of course, part of our parent company, NBC Universal. Were you a That 70s Show fan? I was not. You were not. Now's no, the time. You know what? I did like the hairstyles, so I'm curious to go. see what the 90s. And they will, they will like. maybe make a comeback now. All those 90s hairstyles are yes. going to come back just like the clothing has, to my dismay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. uh, lots of us are already planning our goals for 2023 with many people wanting to improve their fitness. Some of us might end up joining a gym and maybe hope to eat better. But despite all the good intentions, many goals just won't make it past January. According to a survey by the Society for Personality and Social Psychology, out of the 41% of Americans who make New Year's resolutions, only 9% feel they are actually successful by the end of the year. Well, our next guest says it's all about the people around you. Joining us now with more on how we can get and stay fit in 2023 is licensed clinical social worker and author Kelly Kitt. Kelly, good morning. So do you think people have such a hard time sticking to their resolutions? Uh, why do they have such a hard time sticking to their resolutions? And what are some of the benefits that can come from being in a fitness community? Sure. Good morning, Valerie. Great to see you. Um, a lot of times people overshoot, and so they make these lofty goals and end up falling short. So my suggestion to clients is to build a community of supportive people. Really find other like-minded people who are setting up similar goals. There's an accountability factor there that can really encourage and motivate one another, and then you don't feel like you're so alone on the journey. And Kelly, for viewers that might not know where to start, how do you go about finding a fitness community which isn't just a bunch of intimidatingly fit people? Um, you're already working on some confidence, I'm, I'm sure, if you're thinking about your health. So how can you go about that? Sure. So a lot of times there are supportive communities right within your neighborhood. And so oftentimes shoe stores, um, running stores will have walking groups or running groups that meet weekly. There are a lot of smaller gyms as well that hold classes that can feel a lot less intimidating. 
find people that you work with or people within your um, community in your neighborhood that can um, set up time and, and space to be able to follow a routine with you. And so oftentimes it's just starting small. Instead of saying, I wanna get in the best shape of my life, set small goals of saying, I'm gonna try to walk three times a week for 30 minutes. That seems so much more manageable for people. And Kelly, for all the new gym members and healthy eaters in 2023, is there any big picture advice you can offer to people who may struggle to keep and maintain their goals? Absolutely. Go easy on yourself and don't look at things in a mind frame of all or nothing or black and white thinking. If you slip, just make adjustments within the hour or the next day. Don't give it up altogether. Okay. Kelly Kitley, thanks so much for the great advice. Time to get your popcorn or your coffee or both ready because it's Friday, which means it's time for our can't miss list. All the movies, TV and music you should check out this holiday weekend. No one better to guide us through that than Chris Witherspoon, the founder and CEO of Pop Viewers, also our entertainment contributor here at NBC News. He joins us with what you can't miss this Christmas weekend. So, Chris, let's be clear. We want to be inside this holiday weekend, either spending time Absolutely. with family, but maybe that means going to a theater that has heat, that doesn't involve walking very long from the car to getting inside the theater. So what's in the theaters that we can't miss right now? Okay, first up is I Want to Dance with Somebody. I feel like I need to dance for this one, you guys. It's the Whitney Houston biopic that fans like me, who are diehard Whitney Houston fans, have been waiting for for over 10 years since she passed away uh, in 2012. Now, it stars Naomi Aki, and although she doesn't look a whole lot like Whitney Houston, she really does deliver incredible performances and sings to original Whitney Houston vocals. And we see her recreate so many iconic moments. You're seeing her right now at the halftime show for the Super Bowl in 1991. Uh, also, some amazing awards performances, but this movie isn't just about Whitney Houston's triumphs, it's also about her tribulations. So we see her up and down marriage to Bobby Brown and also her battle with drug abuse. And this is really the brainchild of Pat Houston, the executor of Whitney Houston's estate, and also her longtime producer, Bobby Brown. Another film you guys should see in movie theaters this weekend is called Babylon. And this, you guys know that Hollywood loves a movie about Hollywood, and this is one of those. Now, it takes place when Hollywood is transitioning from silent movies to talking pictures, which is what we see right now in movie theaters. It's written by Damien Chazelle, who also gave us La La Land. So lots of incredible, great music in the background. And really a who's who of who's in Hollywood in this film. Brad Pitt, Margot Robbie, Gene Smart, Tobey Maguire, and the new actor Diego Calva, who really brings breaks through, and it got five Golden Globe nominations. But just so you guys know, it, its runtime is three hours and nine minutes. So come to the movie prepared, bring some snacks, bring that popcorn, whatever you have to bring. It's a long one. The Lots long movies are back this uh, this uh, holiday season. My goodness. Lots <laughs> of snacks for that one. Um, Glass Onion came out in theaters last month, but is now streaming. So what can you tell us about that movie? Yes, you guys might recall this film came out. The first film came out in 2019, starring Daniel Craig. Uh, it's about a detective who, this time around, a tech billionaire invites a bunch of his friends to a private island in Greek, in, in Greece, uh, and someone turns up dead. So Detective Benoit Blanc is put on the case that also stars Edward Norton, Catherine Hahn, and Janelle Monet, who we love seeing her act in things, uh, and Angela Lansbury. This is her last film role. You guys might recall she died uh, earlier this year at 96 years old. This one also also earned two Golden Globe nominations. Another great show you guys can stream now on Prime Video, it's Jack Ryan season three. We waited about three years, you guys, for this show to come back and it's finally here. John Krasinski as Jack Ryan, the globe trotting spy that we love. And this season he's wrongfully accused of treason. So he's trying to kind of clear his name. Tons of action, tons of great action and great filming locations. And we all know people can't really fly right now. You can get your, your kind of like traveling fix watching this. It's, it was filmed in Rome, Prague, Budapest, also Athens, so many great locations. Another great franchise is now coming to TV, now streaming on Peacock. It is called called Peak, uh, The Best Man, The Final Chapters. This is from a beloved film franchise. There's been two films that have already hit theaters, but this is the end, y'all. If you're a fan of this franchise, all of the closure you want is coming together in this uh, sort of franchise. And it shot a lot of iconic actors to fame, including Morris Chestnut, you see right now, Sanaa Lathan, Nia Long, uh, just so many others, Tate Diggs, but this is the end. So if you're a fan of the franchise, you can stream all eight episodes now on Peacock. And last but not least, y'all, Emily is back in Paris. 
Emily in Paris, uh, season three is now out streaming on Netflix. Lily Collins is back as Emily Cooper. And this time around, she's having a major career crisis, but also as per usual, a whole ton of man drama. Just like the past two seasons, we're in all the great fashion. She wears over 43 different looks, y'all, over the course of 10 episodes. So they clearly have a great wardrobe budget for this show. But it's one of those shows, once you start watching, just like Sex in the City, Darren Starr created this one. You fall in and you cannot stop. I've already binged the whole thing. All right. Oh, my goodness. Great. You couldn't see it, but you clapped when Emily and Paris did. came on. Emily That's your jam Paris. right there. It is. I've not gotten through this whole uh, most recent season, but I'm well on my way. And it's so bad for your wallet because, like you mentioned, she wears so many different styles. You want to buy everything. Everything looks great on her. And I bet it's not cheap, right? Yeah. Right. No. All right. Chris Witherspoon. Chris, as always, we appreciate you. Have a great holiday. Watch lots of you movies. Stream all. lots Happy of holidays. TV. Spend lots of time with your family. Appreciate it. That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.